So hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the how to become a mycologist panel. Today we have a great group of mycologists joining us from different parts um, of the world. Uh, we have Patty, Juvia, Cedric, and Joao. Um, would you like to introduce yourselves and tell us, you know, a little bit about you know yourself, where you're from? Who, who's, who starts? You can. You're, okay, you're yeah. the leader. <laughs> oh, um, wait, you, yeah, you can start. Go ahead. All right. So my name is Juan Araujo. I'm Brazilian. And so I'm currently a, a mycology curator at New York Botanical Garden. So in short, that's it. I think the other information we can, we can talk along the, the meeting. OK, cool. Thanks. Patty, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um... My name is Patty Cassian or Patricia Cassian, either one, um, and I am currently a visiting professor at Bard College in New York, and I'm a mycologist. <laughs> um, oh, go ahead, Julia. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Julia. I'm from Mexico, and I've been recently hired, hired as a postdoc in Oregon State University. So here I am. <laughs> Thanks. And hi, I'm uh, Cedric Ndinga Munyanya, uh, originally from Congo, uh, Central Africa. Uh, currently, uh, hopefully finishing a PhD student um, in Minnesota, University of, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, yeah, I guess my college is. <laughs> nice. Um, so these are some of you know the, the panelists that we're having today. Um, and the first question that we kind of like wanted to start with is, um, did you know growing up about people, you know, that could have a career in mycology? Did you know that that was something growing up? Julia, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. And the answer, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, it is, it, I mean, um, here in Mexico, is the education is different uh, in comparison, at least with the United States. Uh, we don't have like this um, um, education focus on ecology in kindergarten, primary school, or something like that. So you figure it out, or at least in my case, I figured it out until the graduate program that I can actually even being a mycologist. Because when I started my the graduate program, I started with an advisor, which is working with bacteria. But then she left. <laughs> and then I, I was in a department where fungi was the main subject. So it was, I don't know, it was lucky. I was lucky about that. But no, the answer is no. It was a big surprise at the beginning. Thanks. Um, Cedric, would you like to go next? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, similarly, right? The answer is no. Uh, do I think that you can have a career in mycology? Absolutely not. Uh, the, 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 funny enough, I think the only the first time I was introduced to fungi um, as a, uh, as a, to mycology as a discipline, I think it was uh, my senior year of high school. And I think we were kind of just talking about um, so there, so there are macrospora, right? Which for the um, the genetic aspect, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, there's a there's a whole field of people studying this. I think that's the first time I kind of heard of it. Uh, growing up, I relatively grew up in a somehow scientific background, uh, and you know, and honestly, my mycology was not a, was not even like even among those those were not a common subject. So uh, honestly, yeah, 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 no, no, definitely be a um, the answer in this case. Patty, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, just completely echoing everyone else. No, never met a mycologist until I was in college. Never heard of the, the word mycology, I don't think, until I was in college. Um, so I always was interested in biology, but I, and I always loved being outside. So I had vague interests in like some, anything from like medicine to um, just being in the woods. I didn't know how I could, whatever I could do to just make sure I was outside, I guess. 
but um, I didn't know what that looked like until several years, until like halfway through college. So um, yeah, my parents not, I don't have like scientists in the family or anything either. My parents were both like teachers, um, which is great, but not specifically, didn't specifically know, like have a, I didn't have like a guided direction in how to get into this field. So, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's the same. So I didn't know about mycology. So my dad was a, bi a biology uh, professor in, in the past. And so I grew up with seeing like insect pinned and this kind of stuff. So I started biology to be, to be an entomologist. And so, but I didn't know about mycology. And even during my undergrad, I didn't have, I didn't have too, too much content in mycology. So I had to dig for it myself and that's what I did. So I basically didn't care about the other disciplines and I just did the bare minimum to be approved to the next semester and focused all my attention in, in, in my uh, undergrad project that was in, in uh, ag agaric taxonomy, like mushroom taxonomy. So that's when, that's back to 2006. <laughs> I'm old. And so, yeah, no, I didn't know about a career but attending two conferences along my undergrad, that encouraged me a lot to, and then I started to discover, wow, there are mycologists doing mycology out there. And then when I started to, to build this interest, yeah. But when I first started, I didn't know there was mycology as a field. Cool, awesome, thank you. So because of those, you know, experience, um, what do you, um, like what profession did you want to be like when you wanted to, when you were growing up? I guess well, I'll start. Oh, right. go, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, so I, I guess I kind of answered it already. So that's why I just figured I'd jump in real quick. Um, so I, I just, I guess medicine was the closest thing. I was sort of, that, that was for me the clearest path towards like studying biology, I guess, because that's what, you know, like the big things that people <clears throat> turn out to be in their lives, like being in medicine was one of those things. But I quickly, as soon as I started my, the pre-med program at, as an undergrad, I basically had like a panic attack and didn't, I knew it wasn't right for me, but I didn't know what, what I like, how to, what to do next. Um, so I actually took time off from school. I took a semester off from undergrad and that's where I found, I took a class um, on, on how to like basically a certification on, on naturalism to be a natural, a master naturalist. And that's, um, that was through Cornell. And I took, um, I, that's where I met my first mycologist, who was George Hudler, who was a, who was a, a former professor of uh, mycology at Cornell, um, which is not where I did my undergrad or anything, but I just found that naturalist class because I knew I, again, wanted to be outside. Um, and that's where I first like got an, an in-depth. So I basically it was because I didn't know what I was doing and took a semester off from college is how I found mycology because there was no mycology at my, my college. Um, what, so I went back to the same, it was a liberal arts school, small school, and there was no mycology classes. So similar to Joao, I just sort of like became obsessive about finding my own little ways to include it into research projects in my other classes and, and do stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can go next. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, growing up, I had two, two, uh, two goals. I think one was uh, to become a politician because I uh, really um, enjoy political science um, and stuff. And the second one was either to become a doctor, I think, which is probably the easiest thing, any kind of, not easiest thing, but like, you know, once you love biology, I think that's probably the first step that, that you're looking to. Uh, I had to drop political science uh, because, uh, you know, he, uh, well, let I just say, he, he required me to like um, join a political party to actually maintain some type of job throughout my life. And that wasn't necessarily sustainable. Uh, and then doctors, I, I don't know, you know, uh, kind of maybe to echo what Patricia say, you know, as an undergrad, you know, you go to pre-med, he's just like, he's, it's a very weird type of, um, I, I just had a weird vibe, you know, he just wasn't resonating with me, uh, you know, and then I started doing some um, lab, lab, uh, you know, lab project uh, with a professor who needed like a volunteer. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the atmosphere. It's just kind of, you know, way more than I did enjoy anything about 
medicine. So that's kind of what kind of the gear toward research uh, started. Uh, I first started with bacteria and then, um, yeah, and then later on, I met uh, a great advisor um, when I went to do my master's and then that's how really she uh, kind of helped me get into mycology and yeah, stayed in since. In my case, I don't know, it just, I just started my bachelor degree is um, um, biotechnology called engineer. So it was uh, because I think that this option came because of the, I don't know, the area where I grew up, because it's a lot of agriculture, industry, and this came just for me a little different than the other areas. Uh, surround, surrounding area. So I think that uh, it was a good approach or a good, um, uh, 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 like getting close to working in a lab or something like that. I just, uh, I just take another path from being a technological engineer, a technology engineer, because at the end of my career, I didn't like it, the projects that were offered to me to make my thesis. So I just changed completely to something ecological, to a study, I started to study plants, which is not common in my area, or at least in the university where I study. So the, my advisor in that moment, I think that was the key for me to study beginning to start ecology. And I said, okay, I did my thesis on plants and everything. There are something related with uh, microbes, but I want to focus on microbes. So that's why I start, uh, I, look in, I look for a place to study in microbes. And that's how everything begins. So in my case, I, as I mentioned, I started college to be an entomologist. And then in the first semester, I did a short course, those um, like biology week or something like that. So they offered a bunch of biology related courses. And I took mushroom taxonomy in 2005, five or six. And then since then, I, I studied fungi since then. But before I started college to study insects, I wanted to be a musician so, because I had a band when I was younger. And so as any other teenager, I had a one or two years dreaming about an impossible profession or something that I wouldn't actually pursue anyway. But I wanted to be a musician, then an entomologist, and then mycologist studying taxonomy of mushroom. And then now I do what I love since 2010 which is study fungi and insects, like fung fungal parasites. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so when did you know that you wanted to become a mycologist? Like what was the experience that kind of like, just be like, I wanna do that um, for the rest of, the, of, you know, of your life? And was there someone that kind of like, you look up to and be like, oh, like, I want to be like that person or like all of these different people. So, yeah. Yeah, let me start because it's so, so fast, it's quickly. So I already mentioned, I started college to do entomology and then I switched as soon as I did this uh, biology week or these short courses, I decided, wow, I want to work with fungi. There's no, no way back from that. And here I am since 2005. <laughs> Well, I think my case was uh, somehow similar. I think uh, when I started doing my, my master's, uh, which was when I was actually introduced um, to like a, you know, a full on um, ecological kind of career path. Uh, I did like my first experiment, which was, you know, it was very lucky. Like my first experiment was in the cladding plant with, uh, with fungi. And the first one, like, you know, I could see like strong effect of some endophyte. And I think, you know, at that point, cause I've I always had a agriculture kind of uh, interest Right. And uh, so, you know, and I felt like I could use different fungi to, you know, study ecology and evolution, which is what my scientific pattern is, uh, but also to really do something apply in like, you know, in a uh, food production, something that can really impact. I think kind of that, that versatility of uh, fungi, both in 
the basic science and application really was to me a defining moment uh, that, you know, of my career. Plus, you know, an experiment to work in the first time is always like an exciting thing to, to start with. Great, I can go next. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I have to say it because uh, for me it wasn't love at first sight. I mean, it was a little difficult because I came from another kind of education or background in that uh, in that point. So when I entered this uh, master program, I just take some courses about the uh, fungi taxonomy and biology, and then it started there. I mean, it's like uh, I was a little overwhelming because all the information and all this new stuff that I didn't know that even exist. So it was in that, in that part, it was like, I have to just to say, okay, there is a, a lot out there. So what do I want to do? What if I am staying here, what do I want to do for my career and for my education and everything? So that's, I think that, um, my advisor and uh, for my master and PhD degree, which, which but was in the same place, it um, had like this. Um, was uh, she was very helpful in that part. So she was patient and everything. So she, she helped me to focus on one subject. So I, I think that that was that, that was the during my master. And the program was when I decided. Yeah, so um, I mentioned I took this master naturalist course. So it was just like a, it wasn't like a credit bearing. It was just a, um, like a five day intensive class on, on all these different organismal groups. So mycology, bry bryophytes, um, ornithology, other things. I barely remember anything else from it because I, I learned about mushrooms there for the first time and I became deeply in irrevocably obsessed. And that was in, I think, 2010. Um, and then I, I went back to college um, to continue my degree and I did a degree in general biology, like a BA. Um, but when I first learned about mushrooms, I was sort of interested in them like medicinally um, and culinarily and sort of just like emotionally. <laughs> and, but it wasn't until a later experience in college that I realized I wanted to become like a, 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 a field biologist, a scientist and a um, specifically a taxonomist, which is what I am now. Um, so I took a class on um, tropical biology and we went to La Selva field station in Costa Rica, which is Yay. amazing. Yes, yeah. <laughs> totally recommend going there if you have the chance. It's a world-class research institution in gorgeous Costa Rica and the rainforest. Um, and it was in that class where I learned about, like, I could see how much more we knew about so like plants and about birds and about mammals um, compared to fungi. There's a small little library at La Selva that's really an amazing little research resource center. Um, but I was really struck by how there are, were no books on about fungi and that it was small, but still it had like a few hundred books and nothing was about fungi. So I was blown away because the fungi there also are like so <laughs> conspicuous. You know, you have really um charismatic um fruiting bodies and you know they're every you know like just so um it was really shocking to me so that was that kind of was the affirming moment where i'm like okay now i definitely i knew for several years at this point that i was obsessed with mushrooms but this is the what i want my contribution to the field to be is to like do taxonomy help with basic research and um just get involved that way awesome um that's really cool. Um, let's see. So something that um, you all have in common is that you went through the grad school process. Um, how, um, how do you kind of like knew that's what you wanted? Like, or how did you met like your PI? Did you, did you just apply to like any grad school and then just like met with the PI? or did you meet them before you applied? How was that process for you? Well, um, okay, no, that's fine. No, 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 please go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I just, 
it started with i mean you need to reach first um to some researcher on the program um because it sometimes de depends on the on the, um, uh, the um, on the program you need to um to know with who are you going to work so it just you need to reach several or just if you are in the city in the same city you can meet them and talk about your interests and their interests so i think that that is a first first step to to enter a program and select the program that you want Yeah, so I had a little, little bit of an introduction, non, uh, non oh, okay, well, a different way uh, of joining it. Um, first, because I think my master's advisor, who was, uh, who was a macologist as well, uh, Andrea Polas Asfaro, uh, I met her because I wanted to move to Illinois to be close to, um, to uh, part of my family uh, that lives here. Then, you know, uh, as I said, my first background was in, in bacteria. So, you know, anything microbes, I was really interested. Um, so I went, you know, and uh, my cousin who took a class that kind of highly recommend, I was like, you know, if you come here, you should definitely work with her and stuff. And then I, w I went to meet her, we talked, I read a few of her paper and I, you know, immediately um, I thought that was a great uh, advisor to be, uh, to work with, sorry. And then, so that was how I met the master advisor. And then as I say, it became great, uh, you know, super great interaction. But then I met my current PhD advisor at MSA. Uh, I went to MSA uh you know in a conference uh so georgiana uh you know i saw a talk i thought that was great and then you know you know we kind of got in contact uh, there and then i kind of just developed it into uh, applying here and uh and stuff so um yeah i think msa for me was probably one of like the uh, the greatest thing uh to go to uh, that first year because it definitely helped me met a lot of potential advisor and hopefully postdocs right All right, so uh, can you remind me the question, please? I was, um, I was how hear, did hearing you the story. Major BI. The All right. <laughs> um, well, I did. I did college in my hometown in Brazil, mm -hmm. southeast Brazil, near Rio de Janeiro, and then I moved to Manaus in the Amazon <clears throat> to do my masters there. <clears throat> and along my masters, I was studying. Well, the beginning, I, I started to work to continue my work on, on mushroom taxonomy and then when i found out about the cordyceps and and, and these fungi I, I i decided to switch so there's nothing cooler than, than these in the world so i want to study that and i never came back to, to mushroom taxonomy and then i had to abandon the lab i was because also the my original advisor in the masters was a bit predatorial as i could say she she had all the projects already written and the students that came to her lab was to basically to execute her own projects as a basically a technician so we, we didn't learn too much other than the techniques she wanted us to to learn to do her project so when i started there i already had a, a project written for me so i, I was really uh, upset about that and decided no i i i want to i want to do my own stuff and then i decided to write my own project and then I reach out to who would be my PhD advisor, David Hume. And at that time, I was very lucky because he was, he just got a position at Penn State and he was still a Harvard postdoc with a Marie Curie fellowship. So he had a lot of money to do research and he was very generous and paid for me to go to Costa Rica to, to do field work and to attend a conference and, and provide cameras and all the materials I need to conduct my work. So he provided all that, invited me to come to Penn State at the end of my master's to work with him for two months. And, and then after that, he invited me to come back as a PhD student. And then I wrote a project to CNPQ, the Brazilian government, and I got a fully funded fellowship for a PhD. And then I went to to uh, Penn State to work with him. And he was a great advisor, so he couldn't, he couldn't have had a, a better advisor. But I don't know if you wanna 
we're going to talk more in detail about advisors and this stuff. So that was it. Um, yeah, so I, I think I, I re reached out to my advisor just over email. I basically looked up all the mycologists um, studying in actively in the US and that I, I wasn't able to, I wasn't looking to leave the US for research or for grad school. So that's why I focused here, but there are great programs all around the world. Um, and I just found, I want, so I had decided that I wanted to be a taxonomist specifically, but I actually was fairly open about what groups I was uh, to work on. I, I didn't have a particular group of fungi that I cared more about than others. Um, and, in, but I guess, in fact, I was even a little bit interested, it's part of like sort of my personality to be interested in things that people don't pay that much attention to. So I ended up also working on a group of fungi that live on insects, but they're not even as well known as the cordyceps, um, which are super cool. Um, and I would love to re research, but I work on a group called the Lab Bulbinielles, um, which are, a really diverse lineage of insect associated fungi. Um, and they're on our other arthropods as well. Um, but I basically found my, my PhD advisor, Alex Weir, um, because he was actively doing taxonomic research. And then that was the group that he worked on. And I decided, he gave me a choice of what to work on, but I figured it was, I was best resourced to work on the thing that he was already that he had focused his career on um, and it would be sort of like that way I could get like the best training possible for that group. Um, but yeah, basically the process to find an advisor is to look up programs that you're interested in. Maybe um, one thing that's a little tricky about mycology is that sometimes there isn't like usually a mycology department. Very often it's in another department, something like plant pathology or forest pathology um, or botany even. Um, so it's not always obvious. Like for actually, I remember in my, in my search, I remember being confused about the whole pathology thing. Um, like why, and that's a whole other conversation, but um, it, it actually, I wasn't sure that I, I was like, oh, I don't want a degree in plant pathology. I want to study mushrooms. Like, that's not, um, but now, but so looking within those departments though, you'll often find people who are doing research and then you'll want to look at their research, um, their publication records, their, their lab website, the students that are in their lab and their student projects and see if it's stuff that you're interested in. And then if you are interested in that, you would like send an email basically to the, the PI, the, the head of the lab, PI means principal investigator, um, and to explain your interests. Um, I, rem I do remember getting this weird response one time from someone I reached out to, um, I'm not going to name them. <laughs> Um, but they, I guess my, my email to them was not professional enough. And I got a, a response that was very short and a little bit mean, um, in telling me that my response, my email was not professional, um, which was, I guess it was good information, but it was delivered <laughs> in an abrasive way. Um, so you just want to take care to like construct an email that's, um, like thorough and demonstrates that you've like spend some time looking at the research that they're doing. And, you know, maybe you have, you don't have to have a fully developed project at all, but you could just have an area that you're interested in and you might, that they work on. And um, so, yeah, that, that part, it takes a little time and you might want to have a, your a current advisor, like proofread it or something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I would recommend for, for like the first contact to get into a, a grad program. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, the next question that we had um, is like, based on your experience, are there some techniques or tools um, that you, you think that every mycologist should be aware of or know about? And if so, which ones? And I would make a asterisk here, not only like lab or wet lab skills and bioinformatics stuff like more more of the soft skills so everything well i think i think it it depends on the group you work mm -hmm. with because if you work with kitri just different tools than work with 40 steps for example but i think the first thing is to find a group that you love you're passionate about and just dedicate whatever it takes to study them and i'm not the second uh, suggestion i would make is to be able to find 
this fungi yourself in the field and spend time in the field. I think regardless of which group you work with, you should know your organism rather than a bunch of tubes labeled. So I, th I think those are the two main um, suggestions I would make regardless of the group of interest, but of course, uh, some uh, uh, conf being comfortable to work on the microscope and stereo microscope and this, this kind of things and store your, your material, how to process your, your specimens. Because I have lost a bunch of specimens that were super cool, super interesting, but I just didn't have the skills at the beginning to process them properly and dry them and avoid other fungi to grow. So I think these would be the three main things in general mycology I would recommend. I think that in these days, uh, it is important not to be afraid also of molecular techniques. I think that is something that is actually growing on and this is that uh, something that is a skill or knowledge that I think that you have to uh, learn. And, uh, and as I said, don't be afraid of all the available omics out there and everything. And I also agree with Joe. Well, I mean, I'll probably equal what uh, uh, Joe and Luby already said. I think uh, one of the best skills, uh, at least that I had to learn because I work with endophytes, right? So uh, you really can see or find them. It's a really microscope, right? It's a really, uh, you know, staining technique, um, spending time looking at them and recognizing them and, you know, differentiating septetyphy to non septetyphy what's reproductive structure. Uh, but really it's kind of, you know, it, uh, it really takes time to really dedicate to get to know it. Um, culturing techniques, I think uh, that's a very important one. Uh, and I mean, just not like clean lab culturing technique. I mean, like, you know, how to culture in the field, uh, how to culture from like a, a large piece of food. I mean, um, I think those two probably, um, you know, if you do like uh, anything that is at a microscopic level, uh, those, those are important, important, uh, important um, to have. Yeah, I have like, I don't want to, I, I feel like I could have a lot of things to say, but I don't, I don't want to go on and on. Um, so I'll try to pick my top few. So one is that I, I so these are more like soft skills, I suppose. Um, but I do think networking is really important. So Cedric mentioned that he, he found your um, advisor at going, going to MSA, the Mycological Society of America conference that happens every year. I totally recommend that even if you're not doing research yet. Um, if you're an undergrad, you can sometimes apply for some travel funding to go to pay for the fees for the um, conference. I, I recommend it because you can just see all sorts of people at all sorts of levels of their careers. A lot of very new, brand new grad students, undergrads, um, you know, late stage PhD students, and then like senior researchers who are, you know, just about to retire. And so you have all these different people and you can see all sorts of presentations and get a sense of what's going on, but you can also have conversations with people and network, um, which I found has been really helpful in my career. Um, so I recommend attending conferences um, as much as possible and then not being afraid to reach out to people, just, you know, um, just being able to trying to, you know, just trying to make as many connections as you can. I think that's a really good skill and it'll help um, throughout your career. Um, and then also I think knowing if you want, just having a sense of whether you want to be in the lab or, or like all the time, or like, if you really want to do field work. So if you really want to do field work, you're also going to do lab work. You're going to do a lot of lab work, but if you're, if you're comfortable being in the lab all the time, there are, there are research options for that. If you want to do field work, I do also, I want to echo what Joao said about getting out in the field. I ended up having to do a lot of like kind of informal field work projects. They weren't like academically 
in, or I shouldn't say they were instant, they were not institutionally like very formal. They were sort of like collaborations that were like off the grid a little bit. I don't know how to describe them, but there were just ways in which I like spent time in the field, collected some data with groups of people and like didn't necessarily lead to publications or anything, but it was like extremely really powerful experience for me to like know that that was definitely what I wanted to do. Um, and then also it helped getting, I think in my application for grad school that I had sort of personally um, pursued all these different experiences, even if they didn't have a very clear, like, you know, output or like whatever. So, but knowing that you want to spend time in the field, getting that field experience, however you can, um, I think is really, really good idea. Um, and a follow-up question, how um, do you find those resources like on microscopy, field work, bioinformatics and, you know, know about conferences. So yeah, um, what are some of the resources that you found useful um, in your time as a mycologist? Um, I relied a lot on professors of, in, uh, from undergrad um, who kind of helped me connect me to like, I, one of my professors set me up with like a month long um, internship, I guess you could say. Um, in the Peruvian Amazon at a, a bio station. So I was like volunteering for them, basically doing like inventories of the organisms on at the field station. So I, I did, was not paid, but I also didn't have to pay to be there. <laughs> it's not great, it was, you know, whatever. Um, it's not always possible, but um, I did, I love the experience. Um, and um, so I, yeah, I relied a lot on professors, but now there's more and more uh, mycological societies, um, and especially I think post pandemic kind of like um, push for more virtual options, you can often you can learn a lot from virtual events at mycological societies that are very affordable, like free, often publicly available or like minimal, like, you know, 20 bucks for a year long membership kind of thing. So um, I definitely look for mycological societies in your own towns or cities. Um, they have a lot, often will have a lot of events. Some are way more active than others. Like the New York City Mycological Society is extremely active. That's a really valuable resource. So I would just link up with groups nearby. That's definitely a, a really affordable, accessible option. Uh, if I can maybe add something to that, I, I think, you know, under, I mean, definitely you said networking is, is a, you know, is, a, is an important thing because I think uh, you also have to understand that, you know, skill, skill wise, right, either it's microscopy or it's uh, next gen sequencing, which is also uh, becoming one more important, right, like uh, some of those skills uh, transcend mycology, right, they also are into other disciplines. Uh, so I've been lucky sometimes, like for some technique, I could just, you know, uh, talk to other people in the program, right, to be like, hey, you know, this is, this is, uh, what I'm trying to do and like, you know, they'll give me insight because they either done it or they know somebody who do it. So I think definitely, uh, you know, talking to people, talking, uh, you know, networking as you can, uh, it's, I think it's, 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 it's very great. Um, even uh, including definitely uh, the local market society. Uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're like, uh, just to give an example, um, we do a lot of inoculation workshop uh, around and there are people who are, who are like, very good at it and like the you know the, and then like you know you, so I, I think all those things you know uh, uh help uh, i'll just say like you know the more you can meet people and talk to people and interact with people uh not necessarily just in my college but like in uh, the sense of community as a as a whole i think uh, those could uh, get you some of the resources or at least get you aware of the resources that are available So we're, um, the next question that um, I have um, is more about your current position. So um, can you tell us a little bit about like, how do you get to your current positions and what does a day in your job looks like? Well, let me start. Mm -hmm. I, I got my position, apply for it. So that's, that's basically how we get like uh, permanent positions in, in postdocs. So my other, well, I did three postdocs. When I, I finished my PhD, so I stayed in the same lab for two more years. And then I got an invitation to go to Japan. So I stayed one year in Japan, in Okinawa. And then I applied for my third postdoc, which was at GD Ulcer Lab and the Ambrosia Beatles Lab at the University of Florida, which was, was great as well. 
And, and then I, I started to feel that I was ready to apply for a job. And so I applied for, for the position I, I, I am now and I got it. So it was very lucky because it was my first job application. And so I did four more. So I did five in a row, the New York Botanical Garden, four more. I was hired in my first, uh, my first attempt and didn't get even to the uh, interview for the, the other four that I applied. So even if you, if you, if you have no's in your first attempts, don't give up and keep doing. I was lucky to be, to be uh, hired in the first application, but the next four that I did, I, I didn't made it to the interview. So it doesn't mean anything there. If you, if you heard no five or 10 times, just keep, keep going. So you will find your a good fit for you. So what, what I do, you, what I do? Well, so I'm a curator in my college at New York Botanical Garden. And we have some um, support staff, like some amazing people there that do the, the, the processing, the, the specimens, the processing loans, organizing databases, organizing things. And my position, I do basically what a professor do without the teaching component. So I write grant proposals, I write papers, I basically like any other researcher do, but the good part of my, my position is that for, for me, some people love teaching, but I like doing research more than teaching. So for me, it's, a, it's an ideal position, it's like a dream job that I can dedicate basically all my focus in the research part. And we travel a lot. So I think all of us here, so we do a lot of field work. And I think this is one of the, the best parts of, of my work. And well, now that I have a daughter, not so much because mm -hmm. I, I, I feel so bad when I have to leave for two weeks and, and, and it's a bit difficult. But back in, the, back in the day when I didn't have a kid, so I was happy to spend three months doing field work, but things change. So enjoy your time of freedom while you can. <laughs> Well, uh, in my case, I think after I finished my PhD, I stay one year and a half in the same place, just finishing the, the work that I started with the PhD, the, the project. And then the pandemic came. <laughs> so it was a little difficult because in that moment, a lot of open positions for postdoc were closed or delayed and, and everything. So it was hard actually, but you have to apply and apply and apply and apply and apply. Always, of course, following your, what do you want to do, right? So just, you, I think that uh, most in the pandemic, uh, the social media and everything became very important. I think that at least Twitter is very important for searching jobs and, and you can construct your networking there. I mean, I mean like, like following people that you are interested in and everything. So it's, so it's in that way. And how is my day today? I don't know yet. I started in one week. <laughs> so let's go, but a lot of surprises. <laughs> Uh, well, so I guess as a, a PhD student, uh, how I got here was, uh, you know, um, after, I, you know, I mean, during my master's when I was finishing, right, there was a, there's a whole round of uh, applications. So, you know, I sent a bunch of email to professors that I wanted to work with. Uh, obviously, some people already knew, like Georgiana uh, May, well, currently. So I seen I sent email to three, four uh, professors somewhere like, oh, yeah, for sure, you, you can apply. You know, literally, it's like, you know, I want to apply to your lab. Here's what, I, here's what I kind of want to do. This is my interest. And then, um, you know, and two were like, well, you know, I don't have money right now. And I did one was like, uh, you know, I'm kind of busy right now and stuff. Um, so after that, you know, I went to the application process. I came to visit and, um, you know, I had to pick between two schools, I mean, three schools, but like I, I chose to come here because, uh, you know, the professor was who I wanted to work with was sort of like the uh, the community that I found here uh, upon my visit was a, was a, very welcoming one. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I think that's really how I got my position. Uh, my day-to-day, -day, how does the day-to-day -day, uh, look like? Now that I'm in the, uh, you know, last, the last years of the PhD, 
think what I do more now is uh, on a daily basis, uh, often if I have a, I still have some lab work. So I come in, you know, uh, in the morning when I'm full of energy, uh, that's when I do uh, the heavy lifting uh, lab work part um, that I need. Then in the afternoon, uh, I try to uh, either read a paper relevant to what I'm uh, working on, on writing or do a bit of writing uh, or analysis. So it's really um, those three components, uh, you know, between writing and analyzing, uh, reading, and lab work, uh, you know, I've kind of mix a match uh, throughout, throughout the week uh, to maintain a healthy balance. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously, then do, uh, you know, other activities such as, you know, being part of committees and stuff like that, which I think also are, are important as you are kind of in the student body or even in the professional body. You know. So I am a, so I said I'm a visiting professor. So I have a two year position at Bard College. So that's in the Hudson Valley, like an hour north of New York City. It's a small liberal arts school, which I, this is kind of what, I'm pretty sure that's what I want to do long-term. Um, so I did a postdoc as well at Purdue University after I graduated, I graduated in 2020 and then I did a year postdoc and I was invited to stay longer and I, part of me really wanted to, but I was um, also tempted to be near family. I'm actually married and I was doing a long distance relationship with my husband. Um, so that was like, not great. <laughs> um, so there was a bit of, it was, I would say largely a personal reason why I left just because I wanted to be in New York. Um, but I loved my postdoc position. I was at, with the AIM lab, Kathy AIM, um, who is an, a phenomenal scientist and person. So I love her lab and I loved working in her lab, although it was a weird time because it was all during COVID. Um, so I was, it was a, you know, it was weird for everyone, but, um, so there I was doing, um, I was working on rust fungi and doing D a DNA barcoding project. We were trying to generate like thousands of DNA sequences for these rust fungi to do taxonomic work and to build a database um, for rust, or like a searchable publicly accessible database for rust fungi. So people could identify them quickly and help, you know, they're a pathogen, a plant pathogen. So they're of economic interest to a lot of different types of stakeholders. Um, so then I got this, I also just applied to this job at Bard as a, for, for a professor, um, kind of was the one, also the one job, the kind of like job, I was like the one job I applied to and I did get it, which was really exciting. Um, but I know that, um, like it, the job market is really, um, stressful. It's not a tenure track position. So it's still like a le little less competitive. So it's like kind of like a second postdoc, but it's, this is more like a teaching postdoc because this one's very teaching he heavy. So I teach two classes a, a semester and have re like a smaller, like a smaller scale of research program. Um, so the, the liberal arts direction would involve is always going to be like more teaching centric and then different schools have different cultures around that. But usually it's like maybe any, anywhere from like 60, 40 teaching to research to like 75, 25 teaching to research, depending on the program. Um, and so mine's more like, you know, maybe 60, 40 teaching research. And um, I really like teaching. I really like that, pro like interacting with students and getting them to be really excited about nature and about, about um, like deepening their relationship with the environment and with mushrooms particularly. So um, I teach classes at different levels, like seminars on fungal ecology, or um, I'm teaching a seminar in the in the fall on queer ecology. So I'm very, I'm have a lot of interdisciplinary interests. So I get to like explore that in this capacity. Um, so that's a large reason why I'm really drawn to that. Um, Cause I had a pretty interdisciplinary edu undergrad education and that's informed a lot of my science. So I get to like work, continue to work and write in that dom domain. I have currently have some projects going on that are very interdisciplinary with like um, some students. So that's something I really love doing. So in the fall, I'll probably be on the job market again, looking for a tenure track job. Um, so it's, I'm still, you know, haven't fully found like where I'll be, you know, for my career yet, but um, so far so good. I've had a, a variety of really nice experiences. So I'm happy with that. Awesome. Um, and we have the final two questions. The first one is, um, we've seen that mycologies um, are, have, or at least are multifaceted. Um, so in addition to research, 
what else do you like to do? Is there something you're really passionate about or that you advocate for? Yeah, let, let me start. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, I moved to New York in New York City last August. So my family and I, my wife and my, my daughter that will turn four next month. And so we're still adapting to a big city, which is quite challenging with a young one, especially with the kid. So we're still feeling the city, but it's really nice because we can drive. We live in Riverdale in the Bronx near the, the Botanical Garden. And so we can drive for 30 minutes. We are in the middle of the Central Park, for example. So it's really easy to go there and you have a, literally a planet there so you can do whatever you want so there's really nice to have the and by working at the botanical garden i have free pass in every museum in new york city so i can go anywhere and with my family so it's really really great so for now we are enjoying the natural history museum the bronx zoo the Bot even the botanical garden at the weekend we usually go there so that's the type of things we we are doing right now but before having a family life was was very different Mm -hmm. Now it's more, much more peaceful. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, as for me, uh, I think, um, you know, other than our research, one of the other things that takes time uh, is that uh, I'm part of the, um, uh, at least here on campus, I'm part of the DEI, so Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee. So we try to uh, push that and organize different things to, um, you know, to increase uh, both awareness, but also to like make the community uh, more uh, inclusive and equitable. So that's more on the professional side of things. Uh, on the less professional side of things, uh, really love dancing. Uh, you know, uh, really, uh, yeah, yeah, spend a lot of time learning steps and like, uh, you know, really, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's maybe too much time actually. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so those would be like a passion of me and like, you know, hiking, cooking. Uh, I've been really getting into a lot of lately a lot of um cooking of different style so like you know i'm bought a book and i'm kind of trying to go through recipes at a time and like try things that i would never try otherwise so um maybe, maybe pandemic helped with that i think uh, mm -hmm. pandemic will help with that but yeah this would be my other interest um so i also yeah really love traveling um and so I, I get to travel a lot through research. I come up with reasons to go different places and then apply for money to do it. And it's worked out pretty well a lot of times. Um, and right now I'm, I'm also just like um, very uh, interested. I'm very like, I'm just kind of always been an activist. Of, of, so I'm um, right now working on a group. I for, I'm a co-founder of the International Congress of Armenian Mycologists. My family's Armenian. Um, and um, we are a group of mycologists, all of our Armenian ancestry, but most of us live in diaspora. And we're sort of working on leveraging our capacities as scientists to advocate for um, Armenian sovereignty and um, basically jointly advocate for like biodiversity and like social progress um, as things that we recognize to be li linked. Um, so that's where I, like most of my free time, I guess right now I've been spending working on that group. We're applying to a number of grants so that we can work um, in Armenia and get funding to our colleagues in Armenia. Um, so un unfortunately Armenia is um, very unstable due to like um, political reasons and aggression from other countries. So it requires a lot of energy and attention. Um, so I spend a lot of time working on that, but I care a lot about like the relationship between land and um, indigenous rights and um, sovereign sovereignty and how those things are related. Uh, well, uh, in my case, I think that I, during my free time, I like just to disconnect from work. I think that is something important. And just I, 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 at least just a, a little. I do not have like certain activities like day to day or something like that. I like to walk a lot if the water allows it. And I like um, uh, watching videos about organizing things. 
I love Marie Kondo. <laughs> and, and I'm not gonna lie, Netflix and chill sometimes. <laughs> and yes, that, I think that's all. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then the last question that um, we have for today, um, do you have like any final thoughts um, about how to become a mycologist? Um, this is just an opportunity for you to, you know, if you have any thoughts in general about things that maybe we haven't covered so far, you can just, you know, share them. All right, can I start? Because I, I yeah. really need yeah. to go. <laughs> and, well, so my, I think the best advice I could, I could do is like, do what, what you love, because none of us will be rich, will make huge salaries. So you better be happy with your work. So try to find an organism that you like, that you enjoy spending time studying it, and that you have fun. So the, I, I go to work really happy when it's Sunday night. I'm really excited for the Monday morning. I never thought I would think like that, but now, now I do. So try to find your, your organism, dedicate time to understand it, try to, to be one of the best in your field, and that's it. Do what you love. That's the best. Thank you, Joao. And thank you very much for the opportunity. I really need to go. Yeah, go um, ahead. Thank you very much for joining us. Right. Great to see you, Joao. You. Yeah, same, Patty. Thank and you. I saw one of my, my friends here, Erin Feldman. She's in, in Canada. We overlapped in, in David Hughes lab in the past, like seven years ago or so. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to see her here and, and talk to her in the background here in the chat. Oh, and nice. please, all of you that is... Uh, uh, attending this, this Zoom call. So please feel free to let me know if you have questions and need to some advice or want to come to the garden to see the garden or work there. I don't know. Just feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, Cedric, would you like to go next answering the question about, yeah, do you have any advice or any final thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the things maybe I didn't mention uh, is that, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, sorry, I'm trying to put my, um, to say, it, but I'm thinking in French right now. Um, I think one of the things that I know I did, like, you know, after I finished my, my master, I know I didn't want to go straight into the PhD, like the next semester. Uh, so I finished in like uh, December and, you know, and I was going to, um, to school in August. You know, I, I took a I took a job as a lab technician, but I wanted to stay around mycology. So I want actually to do like a plant pathology lab, uh, which is something that I've actually, you know, never done, but like it really helped me got another set of skills that I, uh, that I didn't get before. And, and uh, I, you know, and I definitely now use. So I think one of the advice could be like, you know, uh, you know, find a way to make choices that uh, help your long-term career and long-term goals and, and stuff uh, while still enjoying it. You know, I think obviously enjoying it is important, but like, you know, try kind of to find a, a balance, you know, like uh, I would say for me, it was like, I wanted to get away from school a little bit, but kind of still uh, stay within the realm of um, of learning. So, right, you know, so uh, I think that would be like, just just my, my best advice, you know, because uh, I think, you know, my college is one of those things like you kind of just have to learn to live it. You just have to kind of keep on living it pretty much uh, to, to, um, to have fun in it, uh, yeah. Thank you. I think that's uh, an important thing, an important thing about uh, being a mycologist is don't be afraid of trying different research topics. I mean, if there are a lot of things that you can do with fungi and are very interested, and I think that uh, sometimes we just uh, the first subject that is in front of us is the, the, the subject that we work uh, the entire master degree or the PhD degree. So I think that it is important that you know about all, I mean, ecology, molecular, um, biology and everything. I, I think that that is important to test or um, and to know where, um, where you are more passionate about. I mean, it, it's, I don't know, that, I think that that is my advice. And, and if you want to change a subject, even when you are already started, but you are not motivated about it, I think that is important to speak up about that. And, and I think that um, study fungi is really 
uh, um, excited and, and, and everything, but I think that that um, it is. I'm sorry. It is still a. Uh, um, it is still in the in area and development. I'm sorry. <laughs> so good luck <clears throat> with all the with all the process and then don't be afraid to ask to your advisors or friends or anything about about that. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, I think my last piece of advice would be when you are looking for an advisor. Um, make sure you find someone you really, really like and that you respect. Um, and that you can reach out to other graduate students in the lab and see what their experiences are like. They might not want to talk about it. Um, they can always say no, but like that's up to them. But you can ask, you should ask, in fact. Um, and you know, you can recommend, you can ask if they want to talk on the phone, if they don't want to put it in writing. Um, so, but I would not hesitate to ask people about their experience in that lab because particularly for your PhD, you're going to be there for years. And the relationship with your advisor is central to that experience. And if it's dysfunctional or toxic, it will really hurt you. Um, it's going to make everything so much more difficult than it has to be. And there, unfortunately, that's that's not unheard of. Um, so you do want to make sure that um, you find someone that you get along with, because sometimes some people work, work great together and some people don't, and it's not because one person's bad, right? It could just be working styles. It could just be, you know, like communication tendencies or whatever, or some people really want someone who's very involved and almost to the point of like micromanagement. And then other people want someone who's very hands-off. And, you know, there's so many different ways that advisors interact with their students and not every way is going to work for every person. So knowing your own kind of tendencies um, over time is going to be really, really helpful and like definitely like don't be afraid to ask other people. It's going to be a little awkward to ask that because you're, you know, you're asking, you're talking about someone behind their back, but it's completely worth it. And it will, could potentially save you years of chaos and um, despair <laughs> to not, to be un, unflinching about it. Um, but there are, but there are also amazing advisors out there. So you just want to be able to work with them. Um, so don't, don't um, feel like you're asking for too much for that relationship to be functional and respectful. And, um, you know, yeah, definitely. That's like, I can't emphasize that enough. Also like, um, you might wanna see where they're at, the advisor's at in their career. Um, if they're about to retire, maybe not the best time to join their lab. Um, you know, if they're not tenured yet, it might be a little tricky. Um, so just finding someone who's like been like established or, doing, you know, I don't know, it's hard to say, but just pay attention to their publication record, how often they're publishing, um, how active their students are, do they attend MSA, do they apply for grants, all of those things are good signs. Um, they're not going to tell you for sure if it's a good fit, but it's a good sign if they're actively publishing, if they're actively coming to conferences and applying for grants, all those things are good. If they're not doing those things, could be a sign that maybe the lab is not as productive as you might want it to be. Um, it's, you know, there's no, it's no, there's no one, you know, everything's different. I mean, every lab is unique. So I'm not trying to say there's an obvious way to tell, but th just those are some things to look out for. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I think that I shared um, in chat um, the flyers that we had prepared so you can find there the Twitter information of all of our panelists and hopefully we'll be able to post this recording on the MSA student section, student and postdoc session on YouTube and also on Spotify, at least the audio of this panel for anyone, you know, if you want to just revisit some of the conversations that we had today. But besides that, I think that that's all. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and yeah, just let us know if there's anything, um, I don't know, we can help with. <laughs> or yeah, if you're interested in having a panel on something that maybe wasn't covered here. So we're open to any ideas and try to make them possible. So once again, thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you, thank you for organizing. Thank mm -hmm. you and thank you all for being here. <laughs>
Yeah. Bye, Dan. Thank you. Bye.